For a while now, we've been talking about the clear distinction between Bitcoin, the currency, and Bitcoin, the underlying technology. And this is a very important distinction because no matter what happens to the currency, as far as I'm concerned, currency is only the first app on the Bitcoin network. So the Bitcoin coins, the currency, are only the first application running on top of the Bitcoin network. Really what Satoshi Nakamoto gave us was an elegant solution to a distributed computing problem that had existed for unsolved for 40 years. It's called the Byzantine General's problem, and it's it's the issue of achieving consensus on a distributed system when none of the parties can be trusted, when the network cannot be trusted. And the elegant solution that Satoshi Nakamoto gave us with proof of work is not a perfect solution, but it is a, a far optimized solution that works at scale. Now, what we really haven't noticed yet is that Distributed computing is not the only area where new science has been developed. And I'd like to introduce two concepts today of new science that I think are going to become highly impactful as a result of the development of cryptocurrencies uh, based on the blockchain. The first one is computational macroeconomics. Uh, basically, what this means is macroeconomics is the study of whole economies. And so it's the study of uh, monetary supply, inflation, deflation, uh, GDP across an entire economy. It's the kind of thing that the Federal Reserve and Central Bank will do. With the invention of cryptocurrencies, we can actually do computational macroeconomics, which means doing macroeconomics not based on statistics, but based on actual quantitative data derived directly from the blockchain interactions. We can see how many coins are being produced. We can see the inflation rate of the coin. We can compare it to the exchange rate. We can see an entire economy operation in real time with full quantitative analytics. And to me, that creates new science because so far in macroeconomics, we've only ever be, been able to study whole economies by proxy through statistical analysis and usually at far delayed from the actual moment of impact. So you're looking at uh, statistics that are trailing by six to nine months and then you're trying to find a uh, causation correlation between the statistics you're looking at and what actually happened in the economy. Well, with cryptocurrencies, you don't need to do that. You can do quantitative analysis directly on the data in real time. And that's never happened before. So that's whole new science. The other aspect of that is computational microeconomics. So where microeconomics is the study of markets, products, and flows within an economy, the study of corporations, balance sheets, commodity pricing, etc. within an economy, we can do computational microeconomics with cryptocurrency. Essentially, all of the data you need to study an economy is right there in the blockchain. And I'm not talking about the big numbers like mining and inflation and coins created. I'm talking about individual transactions and being able to gather massive big data quantitative analytics on the transactions that are occurring within the blockchain. And no one has ever had that kind of depth of insight into economies that are this wide. So again, rather than studying quarterly reports from companies three months after they occur and looking at this, trying to derive causation correlation of statistical data, we can do quantitative real time data analytics directly on the blockchain. Again, this is completely new science. It's never been done before. And I think it's one of the things that we overlook when we talk about Bitcoin, the currency. Even if the currency goes away, Satoshi has given us new science in several areas of life. And I think those things will have a far broader and, and reaching effect in the future. Doesn't a lot of this analysis uh, potentially ride on knowing who is associated with different Bitcoin addresses? There could be some mistaken assumptions built into that, right? Recently, there was a study that was done by some Israeli researchers, and they erroneously claimed that some very early created Bitcoins or a very early created wallet sent a bunch of Bitcoins to the alleged uh, Silk Road operator, Ross Albrecht, and they were on his seized computer. And then they claimed that it must have been Satoshi Nakamoto because they were created so early that only he would have a wallet. And in fact, someone came out and said, no, that wasn't Satoshi. It was me. I am not Satoshi. I was just an early adopter. And actually, I sent those Bitcoins to Mt. Gox, not to the Silk Road. Right. <laughs> I think it's charitable to, to call that a mistake. It's worth pointing out two things. Uh, one, this paper was sponsored by Citi. 
City, mm. as in Citigroup, one of the large <laughs> six banks. And second, mm. at first it had credibility because it was co-authored by Adi Shamir, who's the S in RSA, as in one of the most respected cryptographers until he published that paper. Sorry, Adi Shamir, you lost my respect for shilling for City right there and then. Back to the problem of pseudo anonymity. I mean, I we all know that the Bitcoin transactions are really not anonymous, but they're not perfectly traceable either, right? right. Like we most Bitcoin transactions, we don't have a clue who is actually behind moving that money around. How does that factor into an economic analysis when you don't know the demographics of the people who are um, making the transactions? So it factors in two ways. In terms of computational macroeconomics, it doesn't matter because you're looking at aggregate flows and you're looking at inflation and things like that across the economy. In terms of computational microeconomics, what it means is that you can study in depth in real time with full quantitative data those companies that are implementing open books on the blockchain. So we've already talked about how charities can implement transparency by publishing which accounts and addresses they use and essentially using the blockchain as an open ledger of accounting. Now, you could do that also with public companies and presumably digital autonomous corporations that are incorporated on the blockchain. Essentially, those that opt in to revealing information about their accounts provide a microcosm that is studyable in incredible detail. But the worst case scenario, if you have no information about senders and recipients, you're right back to traditional microeconomics that deals with statistics. So the worst case scenario of computational microeconomics is microeconomics. And the best case scenario is real time quantitative insight into what companies are doing. That's certainly an improvement on what we had before. But it creates a competitive situation where there wasn't a competitive situation before. And so that's good for people who are actually doing the job. But for people out there, for companies out there that like the fact that they don't have transparency, this actually might present a problem because if other people are doing it, if this becomes a normal thing, how do you continue to operate and retain your credibility if there's this, this, this stand? I mean, like, again, do you think that we could actually shift to a cultural norm where transparency is the standard? For corporate accounts, yes, absolutely. I think not only will we shift, but I think it's absolutely necessary that we shift. And that power shift comes from the fact that uh, cryptocurrencies have fundamentally altered the relationship between people and their money and between people and their governments and, and eventually between people and corporations. We're not just disrupting money. We're disrupting the very essence of the modern corporation today. Yeah, it's going to create some very interesting incentives and eventually lack of transparency is going to be seen as as a weird uh, kind of antebellum fact rather than the modern way of doing things, which will be transparency. I think there's an, there's an opportunity here to shift the culture and certainly the ability to derive useful data from that, valuable data from that is going to do a lot to shift that culture. So uh, start your Hadoop engines, people, because when you take the 15 gig blockchain and you unpack all of those transactions and all of the relationships between them, you end up with a petabyte size data set that has enormous value. There's a lot to mine there. Yeah, so I guess we're going to start seeing firms that are forming, you know, for the specific intent of mining the public data on the blockchain and uh, potentially doing something, turning that into something that they can make money off of. Do you think we'll also see people kind of, I don't know, moralizing? Like, it, it seems like a lot of the analysis of the ways that people spend Bitcoin, someone is making moral judgments about it, <laughs> right? Like, oh, these transactions from Satoshi Dice are too small, so it must be spam. These transactions are too large. Somebody must be moving a lot of money around for nefarious purposes. It must be terrorism. So do you think that'll increase if there's more analysis that gets done on the blockchain? Maybe it's inevitable. Yeah, I, th I think it's inevitable. It's a matter of time before a lot of those are proven wrong again and again and again and, and stop doing idle speculation without data. Uh, but but as I said before, the worst case scenario of computational microeconomics is the mess we're in today, which is a completely opaque economy uh, that is rife with corruption and rent seeking and thieving and and all of these problems. And we just choose to pretend they're not actually happening.
So, you know, the counterpoint to this whole thing is that this is not just applicable to corporations. This is very, very much applicable to our political system, because one of the problems that we have around the world with our political systems is that there isn't very much, again, financial transparency, right? There's not much accountability either, but I think that a big reason why there isn't any accountability is because the transparency has been such a problem. So, you know, in the past, if you have to keep gold in a vault, then it's easy to print more dollars than you can realistically back by gold because who can check? But in a Bitcoin empowered uh, financial system, that same problem doesn't apply. And every bill could have a different Bitcoin address that has a certain guaranteed amount put into it. And I mean, that would actually be feasible and would work, right? I mean, like, that's that's the logical conclusion of this isn't Bitcoin to money. It's Bitcoin to everything. Yeah, I would like to see a world where corporations, governments and uh, large institutions are forced to have transparency and all of the rest of us are using remixers by default baked into the clients and have complete anonymity. That's how the power balance should be. So Julian Assange has a quote, and you can think what you like about Julian Assange. This quote I really like. He said, privacy for the weak and transparency for the powerful. And I think that that really is the kind of two sides of the Bitcoin sword here, right? I mean, because it it is privacy, but it's also transparency at the same time. And the question is, how large is the scale of the thing that you're doing? Because if everything is transparent, then Stephanie, you're right. Large transactions will attract attention. And so if it's all transparent, then... That's there. But small transactions get lost amongst everything else. Yeah, they call their privacy, secrecy and national security to to imbibe it with uh, importance. And they call our privacy privacy to tell us that it's already dead. And that has to change. So, yeah, exactly. Transparency at the top, privacy at the bottom is how our society should work, not the other way around, which is how it works today. But is there a potential for mistaken identity or, okay, I'm thinking of a scenario where there is a large transaction that happens and basically exactly what happened with the allegation that Satoshi was investing in the Silk Road. Somebody says, oh, it must have been this. And they make up a story about it that sounds really bad and damning. Nobody comes out and owns up to it and says, no, actually, this was me giving my mother a birthday present. What could potentially happen? I mean, could this be used as evidence against somebody? And who knows? I'm, I'm kind of worried about that. If it's used as evidence, then our standards of evidence are <laughs> then our standards of evidence have gotten even worse than I than I thought that they, they had. are. Well, I <laughs> they know are they are. Bad. <laughs> but, I mean, really? I mean, like, I, I just don't see something like this in terms of supposition being even. I mean, am I wrong? No, remixers for the rest of us. That's basically it. You know, if you're a politician and subject to campaign finance laws, you have to use publicly listed Bitcoin addresses so that everyone can check the the shared ledger. And if you're a corporation that is uh, acting as a nonprofit, you have to use publicly listed Bitcoin addresses. And all of the rest of us should remix up the wazoo. So everything is tainted with everything and no one can track what we're doing. But yes, you will have these weird scenarios where people will assume they have privacy and instead what they'll get is outed for making a transaction. But that's no different from what we have now. The only difference is who the only people who have the power to out you for financial transactions today are intelligence agencies. Whereas with the open blockchain ledger, we can all do this and we can do it to the powerful as much as they can do it to us. And I like that better. Purse.io is a gift exchange that helps you shop on Amazon with Bitcoins and at a 6% discount. How does it work? You create an Amazon wish list, share it with Purse.io and deposit Bitcoin equivalent to the cost of your item. You'll soon receive your item in the mail, purchased for you by someone who gets your Bitcoin in return. You must try this new service. Let's Talk Bitcoin listeners will even receive additional rewards. Visit purse.io. 